Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the book titled Ananda Marga Elementary Philosophy. This is the third chapter titled What is This World? As Brahma is the supreme multiple of the multiplicities of unit consciousness, it is consciousness in its totality. It has been shown earlier that every unit consciousness is non-causal, and so is Brahma. The multiple of all the unit consciousnesses can only be infinite if the multiplicity of unit consciousnesses is infinite. Hence, the number of unit consciousnesses has to be infinite. A question here arises about the manner in which Brahma became the multiple of all the unit consciousnesses that the infinite number of unit consciousnesses exist before Brahma? Or did Brahma multiply itself into infinite units, and hence it's called the multiple of unit consciousnesses? It was explained earlier that unit consciousness is non-causal, and that every person has a unit consciousness or Atman. The history of the earth, however, reveals that humans are not causeless. They are not even the first living beings that came onto the earth. The earth was formed from the sun. It was only a ball of fire in the beginning. Gradually it cooled down and became full of water, and then land appeared. This was followed by the formation of the plant and animal kingdoms. And it was only after this that human beings evolved. Human beings are therefore dependent on the earth for their origin and cannot be said to be non-causal. But as Atman, or unit consciousness, is causeless, it cannot have come into being with human beings and should have existed even before them. Unit consciousness must have existed even before the evolution of human beings. Otherwise, how could they get an Atman? or unit consciousness. Before the creation of human beings, the unit consciousness could have only existed in the cosmic consciousness, as both these are non-causal. And as cosmic consciousness is only a multiple of unit consciousnesses, it was only with the creation or evolution of humans that unit consciousness was reflected in them. Cosmic consciousness as a multiple of unit consciousnesses, must be synonymous with them. Thus we see that the infinite number of unit consciousnesses did not originally exist as units. Brahma reflected itself as numerous unit consciousnesses, and that is why Brahma is termed the multiple of all unit consciousnesses. This also shows that human beings derive their Atmans or unit consciousnesses, only from the cosmic consciousness. Human beings are not without beginning, because their origin depends on the earth. If they have originated from the earth, they must have also obtained their unit consciousness from the solid factor. They could not have got it from any other entity, and so there must also be consciousness in the solid factor. For instance, Butter can be obtained from milk, only because it exists in milk. Similarly, unit consciousness exists in the solid factor. Otherwise, the human body obtained from the solid factor could not have unit consciousness. Butter, when it exists in milk, cannot be identified as butter till it is separated with the help of a churning machine. In the same way, Unit consciousness is unidentifiable or dormant in the solid factor and can only be perceived when the human mind is created to reflect it. It has thus to be accepted that there is consciousness even in the solid factor. The earth was created from the sun, and the sun is only a ball of fire, the existence of which is dependent on certain gases found primarily in the aerial factor. The sun 
therefore depends for its existence on the aerial factor and has originated from it. Similarly, the aerial factor, Bayou, is dependent on the ethereal factor because if there were no ether, there would be no space for the air to exist. The origin of air can be traced to ethereal factor. We can trace back the ethereal factor to be the source of the air, sun, earth, and then human beings. A human being has unit consciousness, and so the ethereal factor must also have it. If it did not have consciousness, how could a human being who has been created from it have unit consciousness? The ethereal factor is crude. It has no shape, nor can its size be measured. It contains nothing and is void. Yet it is called crude, because sound can travel through it. The fact that sound waves can be formed in it shows that there must be something which makes sound waves possible and which gives ether a crude character. Although ether is called crude, it has no crude substance in it. It is nothingness, void or just space. But logically, it has to be admitted that it contains consciousness. Otherwise, human beings who have been formed from the ether will not be able to get unit consciousness. Hence, the only entity which can be in the ether is consciousness. For instance, we find water in ice because it is made of water and contains nothing except water. Similarly, ether, which contains nothing except consciousness, has to be made of consciousness. Consciousness is Brahma, and so ether has its origin only in Brahma. Thus, the ethereal factor, or Vyoma Tattva, has originated from Brahma, as has the rest of the universe. As the origin of air, fire, water, earth, and the entire plant and animal kingdom has been shown to originate only from the ethereal factor. Therefore, the entire creation is only made of Brahma. Brahma alone is the cause of the creation of the universe. Saguna Brahma, qualified consciousness, is the cause of the creation of the universe. In other words, the universe has originated from Saguna Brahma. But if Saguna Brahma, or Bhagavan, created the universe, a very pertinent question arises about the availability of the material or stuff from which the universe was made. Saguna Brahma also needs some material to create the universe, just as a potter needs clay to make his pots. A potter obtains his clay from the earth. So then, has Saguna Brahma also obtained the material from someone else? The material, and its owner from whom Saguna Brahma borrowed it, must have existed even before Saguna Brahma came into being. And that this owner is bigger than Saguna Brahma has to be admitted. It could not otherwise be available to Saguna Brahma. It has already been accepted that Brahma is non-causal. Nothing existed before Brahma. And so the material from which the universe is made could not have existed before Brahma. What could be the material out of which Saguna Brahma made this universe if nothing existed before or beyond it? The universe, which is so visibly existent, could not have been created out of nothing. The only material available to Saguna Brahma for creation was its own self. Hence, it has to be accepted that this creation is only Saguna Brahma, metamorphosed into all that we find in the universe. The entire universe is formed from Saguna Brahma. It is only Saguna Brahma which is manifested as this creation. Is it not then the statement that Saguna Brahma is omnipresent incorrect? To say that Brahma is present in a book means that the book is a separate entity and Brahma occupies that entity. This gives the impression of two separate entities. Brahma and the book which it appears to be outside Saguna Brahma. This is completely incorrect as it has already been established that everything is made of Brahma. 
it has assumed the shape of everything. Hence, the correct thing to say would be that the book is Brahma, or that it has assumed the shape of a book also. This shows that the book and Brahma are not two separate entities, and that the book did not exist before Brahma. This alone is the correct expression, for Brahma is infinite and eternal, and nothing can exist beyond or before it. The book could not have existed before Brahma. In fact, nothing could have existed before Brahma. Every speck of dust is only Brahma. Brahma is the cause of the entire creation, and Brahma is the collective name for Prakriti and Purusha. Which of the two of them forms the creation? We have to determine whether Purusha or Prakriti is the stuff of which the creation is made. Prakriti is a unique force, a principle, the only function of which is to qualify Purusha. As Prakriti is only a force, she cannot take a shape. She will otherwise lose her function of qualifying. Besides, if Prakriti becomes a creation, there must be a force or principle to give a shape and form. The only other entity in Brahma who can give a form to Prakriti is Purusha. Purusha, who cannot even realize his existence without being qualified by Prakriti, cannot perform the tremendous task of giving Prakriti the form of creation. This makes it clear that Prakriti does not assume the shape of the creation. And this leaves only Purusha who could take these forms. Hence, the stuff of which the entire creation is made is Purusha. Prakriti qualifies Purusha to give him different forms, and Purusha has to follow the designs of Prakriti. For example, a potter shapes a lump of clay according to his designs. The lump of clay is comparable to Purusha, and the potter who provides the force to Prakriti. Similarly, Prakriti gives all these shapes to Purusha according to her wish to create this universe. Purusha only follows the dictates of Prakriti in forming this creation. Purusha alone is projected in all the different shapes of the creation. He is the stuff of which everything is made. But Purusha is consciousness. Hence, everything in this creation has consciousness. There is nothing which is crude, inanimate, or without consciousness. The solid brick, the dead wood, or even the earth which is ordinarily regarded as crude and lifeless, are not wholly so. They are forms of the conscious entity, Purusha. They cannot be crude and without consciousness. Yet all this appear to be crude, lifeless, and without any trace of consciousness. It is so because Purusha following the dictates of Prakriti remains in the condition in which Prakriti wants him to stay. A brick is a form of Purusha, qualified by Prakriti, and Purusha stays in that condition according to the desire of Prakriti. Prakriti here desires him to stay as a brick, and so Purusha remains a brick, considering himself to be crude or lifeless matter. The brick is not able to expand its consciousness and remains in a lifeless state due to being qualified by the guna of Prakriti. The influence of Prakriti makes it look like inanimate, crude matter, although it possesses consciousness. Hence, there is nothing in this world which is crude. Everything is a metamorphosed form of consciousness, or Purusha. It has already been reasoned out that Purusha is a subtle entity, which, when qualified, looks crude. In that state, as this consciousness cannot be expanded, he appears to possess lesser consciousness. Purusha gradually appears more and more crude, and finally, he takes the crudest form, or shiti tatwa, or earth, where we find him as an inanimate object, with his consciousness completely dormant. Thus, the greater the influence of Prakriti, the more crude he appears, while with lesser influence, he is subtler. The universe has been created out of Purusha. In other words, 
Purusha, when qualified by the Guru of Prakriti, has created the universe out of his own self. Purusha, we know, is a subtle entity, which can be appreciated only as an idea. Yet the moon, the sun, the stars, and the planets, the atmosphere, and the earth, made of subtle Purusha, are all found in this creation. We have to admit that this creation has been formed by a subtle entity gradually becoming crude. We have already established by logical reasoning that Purusha is subtle. So if the crude universe has been created out of this subtle entity, its seed must have existed in this subtle entity and on being qualified by Prakriti, germinated into this expansive universe. In the same way we get butter from milk, only because it existed in milk in another form. If the seed of the crude universe existed in him, Purusha could not be called subtle or understandable only as an idea. Subtle is something which can be understood or appreciated as an idea only and contains no crudeness. The ethereal factor in which no perceivable crude substance can be found is called crude because sound can travel through it. The ethereal factor has no dimensions and no perceptible existence. Yet, merely because of the presence of the quality of permitting sound waves to travel through it, it is called crude. The presence of something makes it identifiable. It cannot be said to be subtle or understandable only as an idea. Purusha cannot be said to be subtle if the seed of the universe exists in him. He has to be crude, but it has already been established that Purusha is subtle, and so the seed of the crude universe cannot exist in him. Here again, a contradictory situation arises. It was said earlier that the universe has been created out of Purusha, but if the seed did not exist in Purusha, how could the universe have been created? This sounds illogical and unreasonable. And the only logical thing to say is that the universe was never created, as Purusha is subtle by nature, and the crude universe could not have been created out of him. It was, however, said earlier that the universe was created out of him, and as it has been logically proved to be true, the only other rational statement will be to say that the crude universe was never a created reality. Yet the existence of this visible universe cannot be ignored. In fact, this crude universe is created only as a thought projection of Purusha. When influenced by Prakriti, a wave arises in the mind of Purusha, and as a result the entire creation becomes an imaginary entity filled with different forms. The universe comes into being only as an imaginary entity in the mind of Purusha, and no crude stuff is required for its creation. Imaginary objects are not crude realities, for the creation of which crude stuff may be necessary. Hence, Purusha, who is subtle, can easily create the universe out of his own self. Accepting the creation to be only a thought wave gives rise to the following doubts. Number one, how do we experience this world as real if it is not a crude reality and exists only as a thought projection of Purusha? Number two, the creation should come to an end the moment the thought wave of Purusha ceases to exist. Thought waves or imaginary entities are only momentary, and their cessation should bring about complete annihilation. When imagination brings a shape into being in a person's mind, it does not appear to be imagination only. It is mind that imagines, and as long as a person is under the spell of imagination, every imagined object appears to be real. It is after the spell is broken that he or she realizes it to be his or her imagination only. Let us now analyze imagination and see how an imagined object appears real in the imagination. In an earlier chapter, it was explained that the part of the mind which performs all actions is ahangtatwa, ego, and the part of the mind which shows or becomes the result 
of an action is called chitta. For instance, when a hang tatwa sees a book, the chitta grasps the tanmatra of a book and has to take the shape of a book itself. Similarly, when a person imagines a form, the ahang tatwa starts functioning and chitta has to take that form to enable the ahang tatwa to see it. For example, Rama sitting in Bagalpur and thinking of Chauringi in Calcutta makes his ahang tatwa think of Chauringi and his chitta has to take the form of Chauringi. At that very moment, his ahang tatwa starts seeing Chauringi in his imagination. In order to take the form of any object, Chita grasps its tanmatra and first becomes like the rudimental factor, buta, or the state of matter of which the object is made. For instance, on seeing a book, the Chita grasps the rupa, figure forming tanmatra, and before being able to take that form of the book properly, it has to become like the substance or the state of matter of which the book is made. If the book is made of paper, which falls in the chiti tatwa, or the solid state of matter, the chitta will have to become like paper, or chiti tatwa, before it can take the form of the book. Therefore, it is necessary for chitta to become like the tatwa or buta, rudimental factor, of which its object is made. Then alone will it be able to take a complete and proper shape. Why the shapes formed in the imagination appear factual can easily be understood after knowing how an imaginary shape is formed in the mind. The external application of chitta is with the help of the ten indriyas. To be more clear, chitta performs all its actions of taking different forms with the help of the indriyas or physical organs. It is through the indriya of eyes the chitta grasps the rupa tanmatra of a book and takes the shape of a book. It was also explained earlier that ahang tatwa pushes or drives chitta to come in contact with a particular tanmatra. For instance, in order to listen to a sound, ahang tatwa sends chitta to the receptive organ of the ears, to see a book to the eyes, and to smell a perfume to the nose. But while imagining Chauringi, the help of none of the indriyas is required because Calcutta is 250 miles away from Bagalpur and therefore beyond the reach of all the indriyas. Thus, Chita loses its contact with the indriyas and takes the shape of Chauringi on its own. When Chita loses contact with the indriyas, they become non functional. And a person loses his sense of relationship and distinction of place, time, and person. Rama would know of his existence in Bagalpur with the help of his eyes only. But if Chita has lost his contact with all Indriyas and has instead taken the shape of Chauringi, it will not be able to make the use of the functions of the Indriyas receiving Tanmatras from the immediate surroundings. This makes Rama see Chauringi in his imagination, although he may be in Bagalpur at the moment. Because the Indriyas lose their functions, Chitta is not able to receive the impression of Bagalpur, and Ahang Tatwa cannot see any part of Bagalpur. It sees only Chauringi, and feels itself to be in Chauringi. Chitta only takes the shape of Chauringi at the instance of Ahang Tatwa. It does not imagine. The imagination has to be done by Ahang Tatwa, and Chitta has to become like that substance and take that shape. As soon as the imagination of Ahang Tatwa ceases, Chita also loses its shape, and at the same moment, the Indriyas start functioning. Then alone does Rama realize that the Chauringi that he had been seeing existed only in imagination. It is due to this process that the imagined object appears factual as long as the spell of imagination lasts. The moment that spell is broken, it appears to be imaginary and not real. Chita has a capacity of taking the form of an object without the help of the Talmatras, only at the instance of Ahang Tatwa. The shape that Chitta thus takes is imaginary and not real. Imagination itself is not real. The shape formed in it cannot be real. 
imagination may not be real. Yet chitta has actually got to take a shape. And so, even if the shape is imaginary or unreal, the fact that chitta becomes like it is a reality. Imagination, kalpana, has been analyzed, and why it appears factual has also been seen. It now remains to be seen whether this universe has been created as a result of the imagination of Saguna Brahma or not. It was said earlier that on being influenced by Prakriti, Saguna Brahma projected itself as this universe. This presupposes the existence of mind, as no action can be performed without mind. The multiple of all unit consciousnesses is Purusha in the stage of Saguna Brahma. It has been seen that every unit consciousness gets mind because of the influence of Prakriti. As Purusha and Saguna Brahma is a multiple of all unit consciousnesses, he also gets mind when influenced by Prakriti. His mind becomes the collection of the infinite unit minds. Just as every unit consciousness is a multiplicity of cosmic consciousness, so too is every unit mind a part of the cosmic mind. Cosmic mind, as a collection of all the unit minds, is comprised, like them, of Buritatwa, Ahangtatwa, and Chitta. Ahangtatwa is a part which works, and Chitta becomes the result of that action. The universe is thus created by the Ahangtatwa of Saguna Brahma, by making its Chitta take the form of the creation. Chitta manifests itself in a form in two ways. It could, under the orders of Ahang Tattva, take the shape of an object either by catching the Tanmatras with the help of the Indriyas or take a shape without catching any Tanmatra at the instance of Ahang Tattva, as a result of the thought ways of Ahang Tattva. The latter is called Kalpana or imagination, that is, Chitta adopting the shape and form of the objects imagined in the thought waves of Ahang Tattva. Nothing existed before or beyond Saguna. Hence, its Chitta could not take the shape of any external object, even if Ahang Tattva wanted it to do so. Its Chitta has therefore to adopt the shapes and forms in the thought waves or imagination of the Ahang Tattva of Saguna Brahma. Chitta forms the result of the actions performed by Saguna Brahma, and the universe is also a result of these actions. The universe is thus a manifestation of Saguna Brahma's Chitta. The Chitta of Saguna Brahma has taken the shape and form of this universe as imagined by his Ahang Tattva. When Chitta takes a form in this way, it is called Kalpana, or imagination. Hence, this creation is the imagination or Kalpana of Saguna Brahma. The universe should not appear to be a reality, if it exists only in the imagination of Saguna Brahma. Earlier we saw that the imagination of unit consciousness appears to be factual as long as the spell of the imagination lasts. The imagination of Saguna, which is only a multiple of all the unit consciousnesses, also appears to be real for the same reasons. It is this that makes the cosmic mind also consider its imagination to be reality. Unit mind, or an individual's mind, is only a part of the cosmic mind. And whatever appears true to the cosmic mind will also appear true to the individual mind. Thus, although this vast universe exists only in the imagination, it appears to us as reality. A magician showing his tricks in the streets often appears to throw into the air a rope which just remains there. His accomplice climbs up the rope with a sword in his hand and disappears. After a while, the accomplice's head and trunk, smeared with blood, fall down one after another. The entire audience becomes dumbfounded, in amazement. The magician weeps and wails for his friend as he gathers the limbs in a bag and collects four times the amount he would have normally got because of pity and sympathy that he arouses in his audience. Soon after, his accomplice is seen emerging from the audience. How does a magician do this? The entire scene is enacted 
in the presence of a number of persons and it is difficult to consider it false. Yet, it is such a strange show that one's mind is not prepared to accept it as true. One is inclined to wonder whether the magician has really brought back to life his friend whose head and limbs had been severed from the trunk. The doubt that one's eyes might have deceived one is brushed aside by the fact that so many other present have seen the same thing. Everyone could not make the same mistake. We must see what makes such an absurd thing appear true. A rope cannot stand in the air, nor can anyone climb that rope. Even less believable is the idea of anyone being brought back to life after the limbs have been severed from the trunk. How then does one see it so clearly? Everyone sees the show with the help of his indriyas, the eyes. We have seen earlier that the function of seeing any object is performed by a hang tatwa. And Chita takes the form of the object that Ahangtata wants to see. If the magician, with the help of his supernatural power obtained by his intuitional practice, can expand his mind to such an extent that he is able to hypnotize or influence the Ahangtata of everyone in the audience, he will stop the independent functioning of the entire audience. The expanded mind of the magician then becomes the collective mind of all the individuals. As their minds do not function independently, it is the magician's mind that works in place of the non-functional minds of the audience. If the magician thinks of the above show, his chita will take those shapes, and his ahang tato will see the same show in his imagination. As long as the spell of his imagination lasts, it appears to be real. The ahang tato of the magician works in place of the ahang tato of the onlookers. And hence, whatever the magician sees as real or true appears true to them also. Since the thought waves of the magician appear as objective reality, this show which exists in his imagination appears to be a physical occurrence. If the capacity of the magician's mind to project is limited to a radius of a hundred yards, persons in this area only will come within the scope and influence of the magician's expanded mind and will see the same show. Anyone outside the circle will be beyond the limit to which the magician can expand his mind. They will not see the scene like those within this area. They will only see the magician standing quietly with his eyes closed. There will be no trace of the wonderful magic. In fact, the only truth or reality in the entire show is that the magician stands still with his eyes closed, imagining the show which his audience sees as a concrete picture and imagines to be real. Similarly, those who have fallen from the path of yoga go about showing off their supernatural powers. They create coins, currency notes, or sweets out of dust. In reality, no coins or sweets exist. What exists is only the display of the expanded mind of the straying disciple. The show of the magician is a glaring example to bear testimony to the fact that this material world, though only an imagination or a thought wave of Saguna Brahma, appears to us as a great reality. Just as we regard the imaginary show of the magician as real, we also regard the imagination of Brahma as real. Those who are beyond the scope of the influence of the magician's mind do not see the show. They see the truth behind it, that is, only the magician with closed eyes. Similarly, those who with the help of sadhana or intuitional practice get beyond the scope of the cosmic mind see this crude universe in its true form like the truth in the magician's show. They are able to realize the reality of the universe. As the crude universe is only imagination or a thought wave in the cosmic mind, it cannot be satya or absolute truth. And only those who go beyond the cosmic mind can realize the truth, like the truth in the magician show. This salvation or realization through sadhana, intuitional practice, means knowing the ultimate or absolute truth. And those who have known this absolute are called Satya Drashta Rishi. They say Brahma alone is Satya, ultimate reality, and the universe is false. Let us see how far this assertion is true. 
This universe is formed in the imagination of Saguna Brahma. If this universe exists only in imagination, it cannot be a reality. Had Kalpana or imagination been a reality, it would be called Satya, ultimate reality, and not imagination. Hence, as the universe is formed in the imagination of Saguna Brahma, it can never be Satya, ultimate reality. Ahang Tatwa of Saguna Brahma imagines the universe, and its chitta takes the form to create this imaginary universe as a thought projection of Brahma. The imaginary form may not be real, yet it is a form. Similarly, the imaginary form of the universe that chitta takes may not be real, yet it is a fact that chitta takes a form. But the form that it takes is only imaginary, and thus not a reality. The chitta of Brahma has manifested itself in the form of this universe, and even though the form in which it has manifested itself is imaginary, it is a fact that it has manifested itself in the form of the universe. This is a reality, or satya. The universe has a form, so it cannot be said to be unreal, but at the same time, as the form is in the imagination of Brahma, it cannot be satya. Hence, the universe has to be considered as neither true nor false. It is something between the two. It is relative truth. The creation is a thought wave of Brahma, and the day it ceases, the universe will come to an end. This raises the question, why the thought wave has not yet come to an end? And if it has to end in the future, when that end will be? The universe has been created by Saguna Brahma due to Prakriti qualifying the uncondensed Purusha. This creates thought waves in Purusha, and as a result, the universe is created. Thus, this universe has been created due to Prakriti, or, to be more precise, due to Prakriti qualifying Purusha. If Purusha can be freed from the qualifying influence of Prakriti, the universe will come to an end, as Purusha will not have to continue his imagination or thought waves under her influence. Purusha in the qualified state of Saguna Brahma has multiplied himself into the infinite number of unit consciousnesses. It is due to this that Brahma is the supreme multiple of all the unit consciousnesses. In order to free itself from the qualifying influence of its principle, Prakriti, Saguna Brahma will have to liberate the infinite number of unit consciousnesses from her influence. Then alone can the creation come to an end. Saguna Brahma contains the totality of all the many unit consciousnesses. And even if 10 million unit consciousnesses were liberated from the influence of Prakriti, there will still be an infinite number left to be liberated. For whatever is taken away from the infinite, the remainder is still infinite. An infinite number means a number which cannot be counted or which never ends. So if a million or even a hundred million are taken away from an infinite number, the remainder will still be infinite. The number will not be countless or infinite if taking away any finite number, however large, makes it smaller, as that will bring its end within sight or conception. Hence, however large the number of unit consciousnesses may be that are freed from the influence of Prakriti, there will still be an infinite number under her influence in Saguna Brahma. Saguna Brahma will still be a multiple of an infinite number of unit consciousnesses. And as long as Saguna Brahma is there, the creation will continue to exist. As the number of unit consciousness is infinite, the creation can never cease. The thought waves in Purusha, in its Saguna Brahma stage, are created due to the influence of its qualifying principle, Prakriti. And as long as even one individual unit consciousness exists under the influence of Prakriti, the thought wave or imagination will have to continue. And in it is the creation. Creation is the thought projection of Saguna Brahma. How this creation has been formed in the imagination of Saguna Brahma needs explanation. Rama, although in Bhagalpur, can create Chauringi in his imagination. His chitta takes the form of Charingi 
when his Ahantatwa thinks of it. Rama's chitta is a part of his mind, and Rama creates Chauringi in his mind. Similarly, Saguna Brahma has created the universe in its imagination. Its chitta has become the universe as a result of the thinking of its Ahantatwa. As chitta is a part of the mind of Saguna Brahma, the universe has been created in the mind of Saguna Brahma. It has already been seen that in order to take that form of Chauringi, Rama's chitta, a subtle entity, becomes like Chauringi, a crude object. In order to take the form of a crude object, chitta has to change from subtle to crude. This change cannot happen suddenly. Chitta has to gradually become crude, and then alone can it take the form of Chauringi, a crude object, properly. If milk has to be made into chitta, a thick milk product obtained by boiling away the watery portion, it cannot be done quickly. The milk has to be boiled until it gradually becomes thicker. Only then does it adopt the thick form of chitta. In the same way, Saguna Brahma's subtle chitta gradually crudifies and finally takes the crude form of chitta solid. Hence, creation, which is the transformation of chitta as a result of the crudification of chitta, must have gradually become crude from its subtle state. Saguna Brahma created the universe in his chitta by gradually crudifying its subtle self. How did creation become crude from subtle? Prakriti qualifies Purusha in Saguna Brahma, and that results in the creation of the universe. As in the case of unit consciousness, Sattva Guna, or sentient Prakriti, qualifies Purusha first, and Buritattva comes into being. This gives Purusha the feeling of I. Then Rajaguna, or mutative Prakriti, qualifies it further, and the Ahantattva of Saguna Brahma is formed. Lastly, static Prakriti, or Tamaguna, qualifies the Ahantattva of Saguna Brahma, and Chitta is formed. The mind is composed of Buritattva, Ahantattva, and Chitta, and all three are subtle by nature. The subtle or abstract world, or the mind of Saguna Brahma, is thus formed due to the qualifying influence of Prakriti. Buritattva, Ahantattva, and Chitta are the gradual transformation of Purusha or consciousness. Buritattva, Ahantattva, and Chitta are all subtle, but Buritattva is the subtlest of the three. The next in order of subtlety is Ahantattva, and the last is Chitta, its objective counterpart. There is one idea in Buritattva, and that is the feeling of I. In Ahantattva, we find another idea, in addition to the feeling of I, and that is the idea of I do, ego. Anything which contains a large number of factors is cruder than the one with less, and so Ahantattva is cruder than Buritattva. Chitta creates the result of the action of Ahantattva, and thereby acquires objectivity, either subtle or crude. It is cruder than Ahantattva. It has been seen above that Buritattva is the first to come into being. It is followed by Ahantattva. Chitta is formed last. Thus, the movement in the flow of creation is from subtle to crude. It was explained earlier that the universe is the thought projection of the cosmic mind. The influence of Rajaguna, mutative principle, creates a thought wave in the Ahantattva of Saguna Brahma and its objective counterpart, the Chitta. Chitta assumes the form of the crude universe. Chitta is subtle in nature, but it has to become crude like the creation. In order to become crude, Chitta has to gradually take on the form of the five tattvas or rudimental factors, that is, Bioma tattva or Akasha, ethereal, Maru tattva or Bayu, aerial, Tehas tattva or Agni, luminous, Jala tattva, liquid, and Chiti tattva, solid. All these five are crude, and the universe has been created out of these five fundamental factors. Tanmatra, we have already seen, is a subtle form in which the Indriyas receive an object. There are also five Tanmatras, that is, 
Shabda, sound. Sparsha, touch. Rupa, image. Rasa, taste. And Ganda, smell. In the subtle sphere, we find that Buri Tattwa is more subtle than Aham Tattwa because the former is only the factor of I exist. As compared to Aham Tattwa, which has two factors, I exist and I do. Similarly, in the crude sphere, something which contains more tanmatras is cruder than that which contains fewer tanmatras. The complete absence of tanmatras makes a thing absolutely fine or subtle. This also shows that tanmatras cannot help in the appreciation of things of the subtle sphere, where they are absent altogether. To appreciate those things, one needs bhavana, the introversial flow of the objective mind. While to know things of the crude sphere, tanmatras are absolutely necessary. It is only with the help of tanmatras that things of the crude sphere can be perceived. Chitta assumes the form of the creation, which is crude, and as tanmatras are necessary to know things of the crude sphere, chitta has to have tanmatras. It has also to form tanmatras, as there is no other source from which it can get them. The universe is thus created from chitta, gradually manifesting itself as the five rudimental factors, Buddha, and the five tanmatras. We may begin with Bioma or Akasha Tattva, the ethereal factor. The void or nothingness, which exists beyond the supposed atmosphere of the planets, etc., is Bioma or Akasha Tattva. This void indicates nothingness, yet we call it crude because it contains Shabda, sound, Tanmatra. The scientists call it ether. This void or ether has no form or shape, it has no weight. It contains nothing, and that is why it's called void, or nothingness. But sound can travel through it. Sound waves could not be formed in the absence of a medium for their transmission. It is because of this that we call the void crude. The presence of Shabda Tanmatra makes it crude. But this is the subtlest realm of the crude sphere, and it has only one factor, the sound Tanmatra. Hence, the first thing to be formed in this creation were the Shabda Talmatra and Akasha Tattva, the ethereal factor. After taking the form of Akasha Tattva, Chitta manifested itself as Bayu. Bayu, air, is cruder than Akasha, ether. As in this, we find the presence of two Talmatras. Air or Bayu has a Talmatra of Shabda, sound, as well as that of Sparsha, touch. We would not be able to hear each other talk if air did not contain the Shabda sound Tanmatra. Ordinarily, sound waves are carried from place to place by the air. Thus the presence of Shabda sound Tanmatra is essential. We only feel the presence of air by touch, and so Sparsha, touch, Tanmatra, is also present. Thus we find two Tanmatras in Bayu, aerial factor, while in Akasha, or the ethereal factor, there is only one Tanmatra. Bayu, the aerial factor, is therefore cruder than Akasha and has come into being after the ethereal factor. Chitta manifested itself as Tehas Tattwa, luminous factor, after Bayu Tattwa, aerial factor. Fire can be seen and so it can be said to have a shape or form. It contains Rupa Tanmatra the vibration due to ideation producing an image or form. Otherwise, we would not be able to see it. Fire can also be felt on touch. It has, therefore, both Sparsha and Shabda Tanmatras. There are three Tanmatras, Rupa, Sparsha, and Shabda, in the luminous factor. As it has three Tanmatras, it is cruder than Bayu, and was created after Bayu, the aerial factor. Jala, liquid, was created after the luminous factor. Chitta assumed a cruder form. Water is a liquid and has taste and hence contains the rasa, taste and matra. Besides this, it has shabda, sparsha and rupa tanmatras also. It is thus cruder than fire. That water has shabda tanmatra can be observed by performing a simple experiment. Someone speaks on the level of the water 
from one bank and is heard on the other bank by an ear on the same level. Water can be touched and it has a form which can be seen. Hence it has four tanmatras, Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa and Rasa and is cruder than the luminous factor. Water thus came into being after fire. Chititatwa, solid factor, was formed after Jalatatwa. Chita took the still cruder form of solid earth. In earth, or Chiti, we find the new Tanmatra, Ganda, smell. In Chiti we find all the five Tanmatras, Shabda, sound, Sparsha, touch, Rupa, form, Rasa, taste, and Ganda, smell. Chiti Tattva is thus cruder than the rest of the factors. Chiti Tattva has Shabda Tanmatra, as we find sound traveling through telephone wires made of solids. Solids can be touched. They have a definite shape and taste. Lastly, it is only a solid particle which has smell. Earth, therefore, has all the five Tanmatras. Earth, or Chiti Tattva, is therefore the crudest of all the factors, and was created last of all. It is in this final stage of transformation from subtle to crude that Chita finds itself manifested in its crudest form as a solid factor. It is due to the psychic survey of the supreme qualified entity that this creation has gradually been transformed from the subtle to the crude. Its Chita, according to the thought ways of his Ahantatwa, has gradually changed from the subtle to the crudest form, Chititatwa, as it has all the five Tanmatras. Chititatwa is the crudest form, an inanimate object. It has already been seen that in Chita there is only a gradual metamorphosis of Purusha. When Purusha was qualified by Prakriti, it assumed the form of Chita, and it is this Chita that has become inanimate as the crudest Chititatwa. This consciousness upon being qualified by Prakriti, has manifested itself as an inanimate object and has surely reached the ultimate end in that direction. In this changed condition, consciousness has become absolutely as crude as an inanimate object. There could be nothing cruder than this. It is under the extreme or greatest influence of Prakriti that cosmic consciousness has reached the stage of an inanimate object as the crudest form of matter. In qualifying Purusha or Cosmic Consciousness, in qualifying Purusha or Cosmic Consciousness, to drive it to the extreme crudeness, the capacity of the qualifying principle Guna is used up completely and Prakriti is unable to qualify Purusha further in that direction. Thus, in Chititato, both Prakriti and Purusha have become inanimate. Purusha cannot become cruder, and Prakriti cannot qualify him any further to make him still cruder. When Purusha and Prakriti have both reached their limits of manifestation, the question arises if this is the end of creation. Another question also arises about the presence of animate objects like plants and animals. If Chitetatwa is the final stage of creation, these do not appear anywhere in the formation of creation from Saro into crude. How and when these were formed is a very pertinent question. The greater influence of Prakriti makes Purusha consciousness cruder. Where her influence is less, he is subtler. It is because of this that the extreme influence of Prakriti makes consciousness absolutely inanimate in the solid factor. The solid factor, Chiti Tattva, appears inanimate at the very sight of it. The influence of Prakriti has hence reached its climax. Plants and animals cannot be said to be inanimate. Consciousness is reflected in them. They originate from these rudimental factors. That is, the Chitta of Saguna Brahma, the supreme qualified entity, which manifested itself as Chitti Tattva, now takes the form of plants and animals. It is because of this that creation is said to be formed out of the body of Brahma. Chiti Tattva is inanimate, but the plants and animals which have originated from it have reflected consciousness and are not inanimate. They are surely more subtle than Chiti Tattva. 
Chititato must have been formed before these, as plants and animals have been formed out of it. They do not appear anywhere in the creation up to the formation of Chititatwa. The fact that plants and animals are more subtle than Chititatwa suggests that after creation reaches its crudest form in Chititatwa, it then advances towards subtle forms. Creation gradually evolved from crude to subtle. Saro Chita gradually became the crudest Chititatwa. Similarly, it will have to slowly return to subtlety again. Solid ghee, a butter extract, cannot be melted all at once. In the same way, Chita, in the form of solid earth, will gradually become subtle. That Chita gradually advances from crude to subtle is demonstrated by the evolution of plant and animal life on Earth. The first plant life on this Earth appeared as the class of plants called Kai, a form of early algae and mosses. Kai cannot be said to be inanimate because it does show some reflection of consciousness, whatever that reflection may be. After this, plants with leaves and flowers came into being. In them we find clear signs of life, and these definitely have a clearer reflection of consciousness than Kai. Then the lower animals, followed by the higher animals, evolved. At the end of the series, humans came into being. Thus we find that the most primitive creation on earth was Kai, and the most advanced was the human being. There is a reflection of consciousness in Kai, but it is so blurred that one is skeptical about its presence, while on the human being we find consciousness clearly reflected. Creation evolved gradually from the Kai group of plants to humans. Similarly, the reflection of consciousness gradually becomes clearer until it is complete in humans. The reflection of consciousness appears less in crude things, while on subtle things it is greater. In other words, the degree of subtlety or crudeness also indicates the degree of the clarity of the reflection of consciousness. The most primitive life on the earth, Kai, shows very little consciousness, and the most advanced form of creation, the human being, exhibits a very clear reflection of consciousness. This means that Kai is the crudest form of life on earth, and humans are the subtlest. They are more subtle than Kai. The process of creation in this phase is thus from crude to subtle. It was said earlier that the supreme state of consciousness is subtle. The process of creation in this phase from crude to subtle means that creation is advancing towards non-qualified consciousness. Creation is manifested in crude form out of the subtle consciousness under the qualifying influence of Prakriti and it is again advancing from crude towards subtle. Under the qualifying pressure of Prakriti, consciousness takes a crude form first, and later again advances from the crude form to non-qualified consciousness, which is subtle. Thus, the entire creation has two phases. The first phase is the process of the transformation of subtle into crude, and the second is that of crude into subtle. Creation we have seen is the thought projection of the qualified supreme entity, Saguna Brahma. Purusha, in the Saguna Brahma stage, takes all these forms under the influence of Prakriti as the thought waves of Saguna Brahma and becomes crudest in the form of Chiti Tattva. In the next phase, when creation moves from crude to subtle, it is in fact the thought waves of Saguna Brahma which move towards subtlety. Humans are created last of all, and in them we find fully reflected consciousness. This leads to the conclusion that humans are the final expression in the thought wave of Saguna Brahma, and that beyond this stage is the merger of the unit consciousness with the cosmic consciousness. Cosmic consciousness is abstract or subtle, but under the qualifying influence of Prakriti, it starts manifesting itself as the creation, first from subtle to crude, and then again 
from the crude forms back to the subtle or abstract. Thank you.